So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Climate Risk, Challenges and Opportunities for Finance and Risk Professionals. And this webinar is being hosted by the Chartered Banker Institute in conjunction with the Chartered Body Alliance. I'm Sean Fisher, the CEO of the Chartered Insurance Institute, and I'm joined by the CEOs of my sister chartered professional bodies in financial services, Simon Thompson from the Chartered Banker Institute and Simon Culhane from the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investments. And it's, I think, a real testament to the number of you joining us today that managing climate related risks and supporting the transition to a low carbon world are amongst some of our most significant global challenges. Central banks, financial regulators, financial institutions, and many finance professionals consider now that the identification, measurement, and disclosure of, of these are, are massive strategic priorities. Recognizing the strategic importance of this topic and supporting the COP26 private finance strategy objective that every financial decision should include climate change, the Chartered Body Alliance have developed their first joint qualification, a certificate in climate risk, to develop the capacity and capabilities of finance and risk professionals globally in this key area. So during this session, you're going to hear from members of the syllabus panel of leading financial ex experts from banking, insurance and investment. And then following the panel discussion, you will have the opportunity to hear more about this new global benchmark qualification and also to register your interest. So without further ado, and with great pleasure, I am going to hand over to Simon Thompson to introduce the panel discussion. Great, thank you very much, uh, Sean. And let me in turn welcome the four members of our panel. So if I could ask our panelists to, uh, to join me on screen, please. Um, thank you. Let me welcome Paul Dobbs. Paul is the author of our Certificate in Climate Risk Study Guide. And Paul joins us from Australia for this session. And three members of our expert climate risk syllabus panel drawn from banking, investment and insurance, who very kindly gave us their time, their energy, their enthusiasm, but above all their expertise and experience in climate risk and sustainable finance. So let me introduce Ben Brooks, who's Vice President of Consulting Services at RMS. Hello, Ben. Sarah Rickard, Head of Climate Risk at HSBC. Hello, Sarah. Hi. And Leon Saunders Calvert, who's Head of Sustainable Investing at Refinitiv, which is, of course, now part of the London Stock Exchange Group. Hello, Leon. Hi, yeah. Now, we don't have too long for our panel today, so we will get straight to it. Um, if you in our audience would like to ask a question, please add it into the chat function on Zoom. Um, we probably won't have time to address more than a couple, but I will promise to do my best to weave them into our discussion. I guess climate risk is a topic where not a week or not even a day really seems to go by without a major announcement, report, a, a new regulatory, initiative or new legal development. You know, last week alone seemed to, uh, we, we saw the International Energy Agency's new 1.5 degree scenario calling time on oil and gas exploration. We saw the Biden administration moving the US towards mandatory dis climate disclosures. This week we got the Greenpeace WWF study showing that UK banks and asset managers would rank ninth in the world for emissions, financed emissions, if we were a country. And yesterday a Dutch court told Shell it had a duty of care and must cut emissions by 45% by 2030. All developments with very significant ramifications for financial institutions and the financial services sector. But let's start by taking this back to basics first and explore with our panel, what do we mean by climate risk and what are the different aspects to this that as finance and risk professionals we need to think about? So. Ben, maybe could I come to you you first? And um, you know, from your perspective, particularly interested in, in the physical risk side of this, what do we mean when we talk about physical risks and climate change? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Simon. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, at RMS, we focus on physical risks and, and particularly acute physical risks, um, being the climate driven shocks to the system. So hurricanes, floods, wildfires, storms, etc. And we've been using our models to help the insurance industry understand these issues for, for more than 30 years and, and to get comfortable with, you know, really quite sophisticated approaches to pricing and to managing transferring that risk and managing their own capital. Um, and there's really rapid increase in, in awareness of these issues um, and the potential impact of those issues in the, in the broader financial services, which, which is great to see. I think, you know, for us, one of the most important aspects is understanding the uncertainty that's associated with physical climate risk. And, that, and that's really where, you know, models come in because history certainly helps us understand uh, what some of these issues are and can be, but it doesn't give us anything like a complete picture of the future. And that's all the more true when we talk about climate change as well, because, because the climate is changing, risks are changing, and that's where the models come in really. And so, you know, from a physical risk perspective, one of the important issues is this question of materiality. Uh, how do you understand physical climate risk um, and whether that is likely to have an impact on a given entity or a given asset? If it can, how significant is that impact likely to be? And is there the potential for that impact to change materially out into the future as well? Because a changing climate can exacerbate the, the problems that you might experience. And to give you an example of that, you know, a, a commodities trader thinking about risk in the same area as an insurer might have a very different view of materiality. They could both be concerned about the impacts of the changing nature of flood risk, but those impacts would be very different for those two different so sorts of assessments of a problem. And that sort of takes us through to the, the, the last point I'd stress when it comes to physical risk, which is the importance of understanding impact. It's, it's not just about hazard and, and, you know, is the wind going to blow or is there going to be a drought or is there going to be a flood? It's about the impact of that. And, and knowing that, for example, one asset might get flooded on average once every five years and another might get flooded once every 10 years. I mean, that's interesting background information, but it doesn't tell you anything about a prioritization decision. What do you do about that? Especially when you consider that, you know, one asset might be, for example, a food manufacturer, another might be an office block. Those things respond completely different to, to physical hazards and, and therefore to, to the climate change risk. And I think understanding that impact is, is one of the really important capacities that we need to build as an industry in order to make better sort of prioritization decisions. So, you know, in, I guess from our perspective, there's a huge amount of activity in the market. There's a huge amount of push towards net zero. And, and as, as you said in your introduction, Simon, that's changing all the time. And, it, and it's really great to see that. But there's kind of an unfortunate inevitability to the fact that when we get to net zero, the risk will be different. And therefore, alongside that transition, we need to think very carefully about how do we build resilience to the physical climate risks that are emerging um, in order that we can you know, essentially have a resilient society and a resilient financial system to these shocks. Well, thanks, Ben. That's a, that's a great overview of a physical risk. And I think we'll, we'll pick up on, you know, the key question that you raise is, you know, what do we do about this? And then um, we'll go on later, I think, to talk a bit more about resilience and, you know, climate adaptation in the in the jargon as well because um, it's one thing to sort of identify and measure um, how we respond to it then is a is is deeply complex um, so that's one aspect to to climate risk um, but there's another equally important aspect Sarah could I could I bring you in at uh, this point um, so perhaps could you tell us a little bit about transition risk yeah please? yeah so I can talk about transition risk from a banking perspective so transition risk is really the impact of climate change on financial institutions. And that can be, uh, uh, and other businesses as well, and that can be um, due to changes in consumer demand, um, changes in government policy, um, and technology changes, etc. all sorts of reasons. Um, I've heard it described as the risk of standing still when the rest of the world is changing around you, which is quite a neat way of summarising it. Um, and like Simon says, there's, there's announcements virtually daily um, that really uh, focus on transition risk. What that means for banks is really giving an increased focus and urgency to, to decar decarbonize our portfolios. Um, and it also really heightens the risk of stranded assets. So, so those are assets where the long-term 
value is going to be significantly reduced due to transition risk. Um, and one of the key things really um, about transition risk is it can impact businesses uh, in different ways and it can impact all businesses in all sectors. Um, so banks really need to be looking at doing a client level assessment. So for individual clients, and there are lots of challenges around that, uh, data challenges being an obvious one. Um, and at the moment, I think um, the, focus is, the, the focus of the industry is looking at high risk sectors, um, which is quite a blunt tool, really, um, because, as you can imagine, different businesses within a sector can be very different and impacted very differently by uh, by transition risks. So I think the way that uh, the banking sector is moving is starting to try and look at um, undertaking a client level assessment of transition risk. And, and that's a real challenge for us. I'm sure we'll talk about that um, uh, later on. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a hugely complex area, isn't it? As you say, it's um, it's different for every 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 client and um, uh, uh, every every sector um, and um, you know every country around the world faces you know different combinations of physical and transition risks and that will impact you know every economic entity in a in a different way. Some to a you know enormous extent requiring the change in entire business models. You know uh, some of course will be able to you know, uh, and already taking advantage um, of the opportunities from a more green and sustainable. Uh, uh, economic economic model and, and plan. Uh, Leon, could I bring you in um, here, please? I know these you know, these are aspects that you've thought quite quite deeply about. I know during our discussions, as we put the qualification together, you were sort of very keen to highlight some of the you know the existential threats, but also the the very substantial opportunities um, uh, in this area too. Uh, sure, I think you've done a good job about answering some of those already in that in that brief summary there. Um, uh, I'll just double down on it um, uh, for you, Simon, which is to say that, look, if you have a hypothesis, which is a very reasonable hypothesis to have today, that um, the economy will come under various pressures to decarbonize aggressively over the course of the next 10 or 20 years, um, increasing transition risk, but hopefully decreasing long term physical risk. Um, and, and if, you, if you believe that because of regulatory pressure, um, policy pressure, investor pressure, consumer pressure, um, then all companies need to have a business model which is fit for purpose in a new low carbon or carbon neutral uh, economy. And, um, and that is meaningful for every single investor. Um, it's meaningful from a banking perspective to every single uh, organization that you might lend to. Um, so every company has some has some level of exposure to that, and um, and as an investor, you care about it not just because you might try and drive meaningful outcomes from an ESG perspective or a climate perspective, but because if you don't factor it into your analysis, if you don't recognise the, the the those those risks and indeed opportunities, which I'll come to in a second, then you will find yourself exposed to companies which don't have a business model which is fit for purpose. You'll find yourself exposed, exposed to the equivalent of blockbuster video rather than Netflix, um, because they simply have not adapted to the new to the new economy, and that, and that quite frankly applies to everyone. Some sectors are more exposed than others, as you've rightly pointed out. The opportunities, of course, are very significant. There is an enormous amount of of R and D and innovation and capital that needs to go into the process of decarbonizing um, across different industries and with different challenges associated with that. And the need to finance those um, and the opportunity to invest in companies which are you know, at the vanguard of that process um, is, uh, is really quite exciting. It's a, certainly a very significant challenge and I don't wanna underplay the risk associated with it, but it's also a very, very exciting challenge. And of course, you know, some companies which um, have already managed to get to a certain degree of maturity in the decarbonization process, think of a Tesla in terms of being at the vanguard of decarbonizing the automobile industry, um, it, 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 you know, the evaluation seems to have reflected that you know, there's a recognition that, that this company has managed its transition risk challenges very, very effectively. It doesn't have any of the fleet which are combustible engine cars. It's all entirely 100% electric. And by definition, then the transition risk for Tesla is a lot lower than it is for um, uh, you know, your, your, your standard car companies, which we know and love, which have been around for many decades and which have a much more challenging process of, cha of transitioning to their fleet to a low carbon fleet. So um, significant risks and it applies to everyone. That's why that's why I describe it as an existential crisis, if you like, for um, for for the economy as a whole and companies as a whole. Um, but certainly opportunity within that as well. Enormous amounts of capital needs to be deployed to that to, to drive that decarbonized economy. 
Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. And uh, that, that that was a very great build, um, and uh, I think really puts a lot of lot of context around that. And I think I think it's just so important that you know finance and risk professionals globally sort of you know, understand the, uh, you know, the, the 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 really enormous um, implications of transition risk for many sectors and many firms. And I don't think that is as widely understood as it should be. Um, at the moment. So I think the, the parallel you make between sort of Blockbuster and, and Netflix should say, of course, you know, other streaming services are available is a uh, is a very, very good one. Um, Paul, if I could, could come to you as our distinguished author of the, the, the study guide, because one of the other areas we, we very much cover in the study guide in terms of the basics of, of, of climate risk is, you know, what are we talking, you know, what do we mean when we talk about climate risk? Is it is it a, a single standalone risk, something called climate risk that we neatly divide into physical and transition risks? Um, and then others will also add perhaps litigation and liability risks to that too. Or should we think of it more in terms of a, of a, of a cross-cutting, of a, of a transverse risk that um, impacts on most, if not all other risk types? Oh, thank you, Simon, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's, it's a very good question because the, the panel's already touched upon, you know, highlighting the types of risks um, that climate change is, is creating. I think the next stage is then, you know, as an organisation, for example, um, you know, how do you go about then um, capturing and identifying and going about analysing those risks? And I, I suppose it's firstly important to highlight, um, you know, it won't be the same for every organization, number one. But what, what I can say with, you know, the many banks that I've been working with is uh, a, a lot of the financial institutions are approaching climate risk in terms of a transverse way um, rather than a standalone way. And, and what do I mean by transverse? Um, transverse uh, means... You know, the risks of climate change, of these fiscal risks and transitional risks that the, the, the rest of the panel have been talking to previous to myself, um, will translate into some form of existing risk um, within the institution. And those types of risk will be classed as market risk, they can be credit risk, operational risk, all the way through to uh, liquidity risk as well. Now, given a lot of the institutions today uh, have over many decades been refining, invested heavily in their risk management practices. Uh, we see a lot of these organisations leveraging off that um, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of expertise as well, um, and being able to better understand then how they go about embedding climate change analysis within their organisation. Now, that's not to say that all organisations will do that, there will be many factors that will drive that, right? There will be, you know, what is your capabilities in terms of resources, investment, budgets, and so forth as a result. But given the, the skill shortage that we are already seeing anyway um, around the world, uh, we do see that, uh, you know, the current risk management areas are best equipped to be able to understand on how they can translate things like um, financial data with non-financial data, and we'll get into that in, in, in another topic, and, and then work with that in terms of the current scenarios, i.e. those macroeconomic scenarios, um, and translating those more into a, a more kind of climate flavour, so to speak. Now, looking at the broader environment, you know, it, it, it is it of today is the majority of institutions are going about in the transverse way, and that is i.e. integrating risk, climate risk within their risk management framework as a result. Have I seen few do it as a standalone and set it up on their own? Um, yes, I have, um, but they are very much in the minority as a result. Great, thanks. And uh, you, you picked up on two points there we do want to touch on later. You've talked about the, the critical importance of, of skills and capacity and capability building, which is, of course, one of the reasons why the Chartered Body Alliance has put together this, this qualification. Um, yeah, and, you know, you started to address some of the some of the challenges and and that's really what I'd like to turn to now because um now that we've uh, now that we know what climate risks are and what we're what we're talking about you know, what are some of the challenges we face in identifying and addressing climate risks I mean I, I think you all touched on them a little bit in your opening remarks but um Paul you maybe to bring you 
back again. I mean, you you touched on the the, the, the data challenges briefly. So so did um, so did Sarah. Um, so um, yeah, I know it's a big question, but briefly, where are the the major data challenges, and you know how are we you know the finance sector trying to address these? Yeah, it's another good question, because I think for the majority of people in this call, they, they would have been well aware of hearing that that data is a, a huge issue um, in the climate risk challenge. So it, it, it may not be anything new to hear that for many on, on the um, on the uh, call today. But the, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, we are talking about, you know, completely different new data sets. So if you want to categorize them, you know, we, we have the traditional financial data that many organizations and financial institutions are running to date. Um, but then we have this non-financial data element now, um, which is need to be combined with the financial data uh, to be able to kind of generate those meaningful, for example, data sets, which then go into your scenarios and start generating meaningful, you know, numbers and analysis to kind of act on those as a result. There is a proliferation of, if you want to call them ESG data or climate data providers um, out there. Um, many of those have kind of spawned specifically over the last three, four years as a result. Uh, I think, you know, based on my analysis now that there are approximately 100 and 200 uh, vendors out there um, globally. Um, but there is huge consolidation across this as well um, because of those data gaps. Those data gaps are very much broken down across um, not just industries and sectors, but all the way to geographies and countries and regions as well. Uh, given that you know, areas and regions like the UK and Europe um, have always been leaders um, in the climate risk challenge, it, it always made sense that, you know, there was a lot of data being produced there, um, mainly on the back because from a disclosure perspective, um, a lot of organisations um, were doing their TCFD disclosures. So they were generating uh, those backward looking data um, you could call them. Um, and as a result as well, you know, we see a lot of forward looking data providers as well. And those are very much known as geospatial financial providers or satellite imagery as well, which are combining machine learning um, and AI technologies as well um, as a result. But going back to the original question, um, the challenges are great because in some industries and sectors, there are really, really good data sets. Um, one area, you know, as an example, is the energy sector, um, and there's good data around that. But in other areas, it, it's very sporadic as a result, right? So it, it's it's going to be working well for for some people who have different types of portfolios, but for organisations who operate on a global nature who operate in various geographical locations across various industries and sectors. That actually means that you need to get data on a granular level across all those areas. Um, and the issue is today is we just don't have that level of granularity like we do for financial data. But that's not to say that it's not moving quickly and it's not moving in the right direction. Um, Leon would be very much, um, you know, well placed coming from, you know, his role and the institution or the organisation that he's working for um, as a result. Well, but let's, um, let's, let's because I think that's a great link to to that. I was going to say, of course, we, we have, um, you know, uh, Leon's company, Infinitive is one of the major data providers, not just in this space, but many others. Um, ben and RMS, you're producing you know, a lot of data and modeling in the um, you know, in the physical risk area. So I thought perhaps, you know, from what you're seeing on the, the, the demand side, how do you assess where we are with data? And then, you know, Sarah, of course, as a, as a, as a user of data, one thing I'm particularly interested in is, you know, um, there is, although we can often complain there's, there's not enough data, um, in fact, is it that there's just too much data, there's too much noise, and it's, it's not the data as such, it's, it's the usability of data that's the key. So I don't know, would my panellists like to sort of reflect on some of those points, maybe? Uh, perhaps sort of Leon and Ben, first of all? 
Uh, I can see Sarah's keen to, to oh, keen to speak. So I was Sarah, about go to ahead. just respond um, to that particularly. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, uh, I mean, look, one thing we haven't mentioned that we, we should do when we're talking about data is a climate stress test um, that the Bank of England have, uh, you know, set for this year. Um, and some of the challenges around that, but, you know, one of the outputs of the stress test will be the development of data across big financial institutions because we just need to do that. I mean, well, yeah, uh, uh, one of the challenges of the stress test was we just didn't have the data to be able to do it. And therefore we've had a, a really focused drive over the past few months to, to, to develop that data infrastructure and, and also the modeling as well to be able to do the stress test. If I may also just mention one other thing, um, and I think we've sort of had a question that touches on this, and that's, um, you know, some of the data challenges are, um, are particularly difficult within uh, medium and small size businesses because of the reliance on publicly available information, which clearly is available for larger businesses, but isn't available in the, the smaller end of the market. And I think that that's another area that, um, you know, banks are struggling with and, and we need to be able to come up with a solution. And the reality is we probably need to be able to ask our clients about that, you know, to get the data. And therefore, you know, the importance of being able to train our staff and, you know, linking into this qualification in particular. Um, but also the challenges around, you know, the clients themselves having thought about this um, and some of the smaller clients really their thinking is, is much less mature. So um, thank you, Sarah, and I, and, and I agree. Let me see if I, given the fact I work for a very large market data company, I should probably have some thoughts about this. Let me see if I can synthesize um, what I think the major challenges are. Um, I think the, the first is that there is no mandatory disclosure yet, or at least there hasn't been up until this point. The beginnings of mandatory regulated disclosure are coming into effect effectively this year, um, driven by the EU. Um, but up until this point, you haven't had that. So ESG data really only exists, quite frankly, as a result of investor pressure to a very large degree. Um, that will change. Um, there are no really good standards of reporting, which is slightly different to um, mandatory disclosure. Um, if you think about uh, uh, an annual report from a company, you know what, you know that you expect to find a, a p in there, you know you expect to find, you know, certain statements in there. Um, and there's nowhere that you can go to today where you just know that, well, okay, well, this is where the, the ESG or the carbon related data is going to be, right? You have to sift through enormous amounts of information It's typically in textual format and so on and so forth. So there's a standardization challenge as well, of which there are a number of players in the industry that are maturing around um, how to create standards there, SASB and GRI and TCFD, um, which Sarah just mentioned, are, are, are important in that process. Um, you've also got this focus on most ESG data today is focused on the operations of the company, what they're responsible for, in this case, scope one and scope two carbon emissions. Um, and that uh, underplays the importance of carbon emissions, which the companies contribute to both in their products and services, which is actually very, very meaningful for carbon intensive industries. It's the products and services, which are the problem around carbon emissions rather than the scope one, and scope two uh, emissions, and indeed in the supply chain of companies. Um, uh, so, you know, you've got the challenge of the need to build out data effectively in, in those areas. And then fourth, I would say, and this is where I think Ben and, and RMS come in, is this, this area of geolocation, geospatial data where you can't necessarily expect companies to report effectively on their own physical risk exposures because it requires a degree of external um, uh, expertise um, and, and, and enormous amounts of number crunching and then location of assets. It's a big data problem of mapping assets to specific physical locations, understanding who owns those assets. It's actually something that London Stock Exchange Group and RMS are working on in the background to, to help try and solve. But, but that's a real big data challenge. It's not something you can necessarily expect companies to report on in the short term to, to understand those physical risk exposures. And then just finally rounding it out, the fifth thing, and I agree with Sarah, is it's not just underlying data. There are models that need to be built here. There are um, there is methodology um, that needs to be built in order to understand what your what your risk exposures look like. Um, and that that can be non trivial work. You, of course, need the data to plug into them. Model without data doesn't doesn't give you much, but it's not just raw data that's required. So I think those are those are, are, are the core problems. And um, and certainly, you know, we're on a journey to try and address a, a lot of those, including um, with industry um, uh, bodies like you know, Future of Sustainable Data Alliance and things like that. Um, but um, Ben, let me let me hand over to you for further thoughts on the data challenge. Yeah, thanks, Leon. I I, I absolutely agree with with what you and Sarah said so far. I, mean, I think 
think one of the interesting things for me is that uh, as part of the kind of capacity building process in understanding climate change risk and, and how to manage it, um, part of that is about the internal uh, communications within large firms. And, you know, for example, there are pockets of many large institutions that do think about physical climate risk and they think about it quite a lot because they purchase insurance that covers them against major disasters. Um, and there's data that goes into that process, which is often collected by the companies themselves or, or perhaps by their broker on their behalf, but, but the data exists. It just maybe isn't then being shared across the organization in, in a way that's a part of a consistent kind of climate risk management approach. So I think there's, I think there's availability of data there that, that is you know, down to the, uh, the internal awareness and communication across many different stakeholders in, in what are, you know, let's face it, very complex businesses. Um, and I think the other part of that is that you, there, there's a real case study here in the, in the shape of the insurance market who have built this capacity over time to understand physical risk and how to price it. And if you wind the clock back, you know, it's not that long ago that there wasn't very much data going into the, the process of, of buying insurance and, you know, insurers would do their accumulation management with pins in maps. And, you know, there's there's been a heck of a lot of progress since then. Right. So there is a there is a real case study there as to how that evolution can happen. Um, and I, you know, my belief is the capacity will build here and, and there are very real parallels to draw. It's it's a capacity building exercise that will likely take years. Um, but it, it starts with asking the question, you know, what, what is my exposure to climate change risk? But then you have to break that down. What is, what is the exposure? What am I invested in? Where is it? Um, what climate risk is it exposed to? Physical transition, both. How do I begin to try to get my arms around the size of that problem and to prioritize across it? And, and that's where I think quantitative assessment is, is just so important because that's what enables you to make prioritizations is is asset a might do about that no, thanks all and uh, on the subject of kind of the, the challenges of, of climate risk and uh, I, i've been um, uh, as we've been talking i've been scanning the, the 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 questions coming from the audience and there's there's lots of them and we we're, there's no way we're going to get get through them all I'm, I'm sorry but there are quite a few questions on the broad subject of you know what you know, what do we mean when we talk about green or what do we what do we mean by a sort of transition to net zero? What, what do we what do we mean when we're talking about sort of decarbonizing? Um, of course, that's something we do touch on quite a lot in the in, in the in the qualification and elsewhere. But, you know, we still, despite the uh, the development of taxonomies, we have the EU taxonomy is is has had a lot of um, publicity recently. Um, uh, you know, the UK is uh, embark in a project to develop its own taxonomy. Many other countries have, have theirs, perhaps most notably uh, China. Um, but I think this kind of gets to the heart of a lot of discussions about here. Um, so, so again, an open question to any of my, my panelists, uh, really. What, you know, what should we be thinking about when we're talking about these concepts like green and brown and a transition from one to the others? And, and actually, is green a case of black and white, or is it shades of green? Um, so from my perspective, look, I think, um, I think this underlines the importance of uh, consistent taxonomy. And I do understand the challenges around, you know, different taxonomies in different regions around the world. And for large international or, uh, organizations such as mine, then, you know, you can imagine that's quite a, quite a challenge. Um, if I may make one point that I think is relevant is that um, how this impacts climate disclosures, because um, you know the data within climate disclosures, unless there is some sort of consistency, it makes it very difficult to compare and contrast different organisations. So I know that there is a lot of work going on in the industry to to really come up with some sort of consistent uh, taxonomy and um, you know data reference points. Um, to be able to do that, it, it is important. Um, Simon, I think your reference to shades of green um, uh, goes back to Mark Carney, doesn't it? Um, and his suggestion he needed, you know, um, uh, many shades. And I think I think that's probably true. I think that like, fundamentally, the identification of what is green is 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 attempt to try and identify what is low carbon. 
um, and and how can you get to that? Um, how can you drive to that? And of course, in in some industries, that's about energy. A, a lot of this, you know, maybe about energy production or transportation or whatever it is. In which case, what do the what does the production of of low carbon energy production look like, and how do you get there? And there is a there are legitimate questions around what does a transition look like, and it might not look the same in all in all places in 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 the world. It can be. Um, very much more challenging to move to low carbon energy production in some locations in the world than it is in others. Um, but there needs to be that, it needs to be you know, clarity around the, around the uh, trajectory. And I guess some of the challenges also include things like the question mark over is the transition from oil, um, from coal and oil to gas part of the transition, for instance. And I think largely the suggestion is, well, look, you have to put in so much infrastructure and spend so much money to move to gas from, from oil and coal. Um, that actually, you know, for the targets that we have around 2030 and 2050, it probably isn't a suitable transition, but it may be in some cases. And so there's a degree of nuance there, which, which you can't just kind of create blanket statements around without looking at the individual um, instances and circumstances. So that, that shades of green, I think, is important. But fundamentally, what we're trying to identify is trying to identify what is consistent with, you know, low carbon um, uh, economy. And uh, Paul, sorry to put you on the, the the spot here, and we haven't prepared for this, but um, I think it's it's relevant. And you know, you're in Australia. I know, I know. You know, we, we can't ask you to speak for Australia. You're not the official representative, but you are there, and you are Australian. So um, you know, Australia perhaps has has had certainly until very recently a, a sort of different perspective on this. You know, being a very uh, fossil fuel and resource intensive country. So you know, how how's this 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 whole debate being seen from from where you are at the moment? Well, it's it's uh, for me. Australia is very much like the US, right? Where it it's it it has a federal level government, and then the individual states um, have their state governments, and they have um, more power in how their their state is run. Um, from a federal level, uh, it, it's no surprise to many um, on this call that you know Australia is a laggard. Um, notably because they haven't um, you know aligned to any uh, net zero 2050 targets um, but in saying that from a state level um, there is a lot going on in terms of investment infrastructure um, investment uh, in working with technology providers um, and various industries and sectors which drive this area taking commodities out you know agriculture is a big area um, and there is a lot of investment that's been going on for example in decades across um, you know new types of fertilizer um, you know the storage of water capacity to address uh, water risk um, all the way through to um, you know new techniques and mitigating soil erosion and so forth um, through to something like Sydney who in the CBD, it, it, it's very much run um, all on, on solar um, as a result. So, you know, the, there are great pockets um, and it is like the rest of the world where, you know, the corporations in the institutions are leading this at the moment and, and not so much the government. Um, that's not to say in, in the UK and Europe, of course, it, it's quite different, but um, there is a lot going on from an institutional point of view, um, mainly because as well that uh, like in all countries around the world, there's a lot of shareholder proxies going on, forcing change within organizations um, and litigation going on as well to force these organizations to disclose, do they take climate change into consideration? And if they do, how are they doing it? Um, now, litigation hasn't gone through to the full qualification yet because a lot of the institutions have backed down before going to litigation and they've said, OK, yes, we're going to start disclosing this. So it, it's a slow burn. Um, but what I must say is since being here, um, the activity is a lot higher than what it's given credit to, to what you're hearing from overseas, given Australia's really, really big commodities producer, um, there is investment going on and, and more than is anticipated, to be perfectly honest. But could they do a lot more? Of course they could. 
Well, thank, and, and uh, I really liked some of the the really kind of practical examples you gave us of the um, some of the resilience and adaptation measures, you know, about sort of water storage and things, which kind of brings us back to where we we well, to some of the comments Ben made uh, right at right at the start about the importance of uh, resilience and adaptation. And I, I said, well, perhaps would would come back to this. It also um, links. I've seen um, there was a, a question from Kevin. Um, uh, which, uh, which in fact he sent in, in in advance, which talks to us about the extent to which we should be focusing more on adaptation as opposed to mitigation. Um, because, um, you know, however quickly we manage to get to net zero, um, you know, we have to remember net zero still presumes a uh, global warming of at least one and a half degrees. And uh, certainly we're, we're, we're nowhere on that trajectory yet as a planet. So by mid-century, we may well be looking at um, uh, temperatures significantly higher than that. So uh, that's my final question this morning. Um, I'm afraid we've only got a, 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 a short amount of time left, but um, where should we be focusing on adaptation and resilience? Perhaps, Ben, do you want to come in on that point? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, from, from the insurance market perspective, um, and, and I think actually more broadly in, you know, in lending and, that, and, and those sorts of areas, there are, there are real questions around how do um, how do these things play out in, in terms of some sort of tensions in the system as, as environmental risks increase? How does that play against sort of the social responsibility that a number of companies feel? And so I think there's a there's a question of a sort of requirement to mitigate and adapt rather than you know sort of essentially walk away from some of these problems because you have that natural tension in the system. Your your environmental and your social could lead you to different conclusions. And, you know, would it be reasonable as a mortgage underwriter to stop underwriting risks in a deprived area near the coast? Probably not, because it's going to lead to greater deprivation. It's going to lead to social problems. And, and that may not be something that, that you would want to associate with, but from a, you know, sort of pure risk management perspective, well, you know, it might, that might not be the most attractive business to write anymore. Now, of course, there are things that we can do to adapt and, you know, as as build, building codes change all the time, for example, in terms of, you know, whenever there's a, a major hurricane or a major event, there are lessons to be learned. And so it's quite natural that, um, you know, institutions learn, but so does society. And therefore you can, you can better represent ways in which you, you adapt collectively to, to, to improve your, your resilience overall. Um, I, you know, again, I think one of the things that's really important there is this notion of um, determining the quantified differences and how to respond to that. If you're, if you're going to attempt to make some sort of resilience or adaptation, understanding a return on investment, understanding how much it's going to cost and what you get back from doing that is, is fundamentally important. You know, should I, should I think about building a three foot seawall or a 12 foot seawall? Well, how much risk does that reduce and, and what's the payback on, on that ad adaptation? And again, you know, these models are a fundamental part of, of understanding those sorts of um, implications. So th there's a huge amount that can be done from, from a risk and, and an adaptation standpoint. Um, all sorts of really interesting technologies emerging, you know, temporary flood barriers that can be put up inside half an hour. Um, you can get, you can get, you know, systems installed on your house that will spray it with flame retardant whenever a wildfire is coming anywhere near it, right? It's extraordinary what you can do. If that's it, whether or not that's an economic or a practical thing to do is, is an entirely different question. But, you know, to Leon's point, there's huge innovation potential and there's huge opportunity in, in our ability to offer more insurance coverage and quicker recoveries as a consequence of that. So, you know, again, I think it comes back to this, this notion of the, the size of the opportunity that, that climate change presents. I wish we had more time to kind of explore some of those really interesting technologies. That shows where some of the opportunities also lie for financial services in 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 in, in climate change and climate adaptation too. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah, Leon, Ben, and, and Paul. I'm sorry if I only had time for such a short discussion when there's so much more we we could and probably should have explored with you in this session and, and you know during our syllabus panel meetings over the past few months we've we've had some really incredible conversations and rich insights from you and our other panel members that I've certainly learned a great deal from and I hope everyone listening has come away with a, a sense of the expertise the experience the enthusiasm you've all brought to this um, which I hope we've well, we have done our best to distill into our new certificate in climate risk. So if you'd like to know more, then we'd love to have you, of course, register for the new qualification. Um, now, uh, can I hand you back to Sean? And thank you.
пойдем. Oh, I think you can hear me. I, 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 I'm not sure you can see me. <laughs> What's happened? Oh, I've appeared. <laughs> Sorry about that. We, we were doing so well with the, uh, with the technology here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, absolutely fascinating uh, panel discussion. Um, and I was just asked if I would say just a few words um, about why uh, the three chartered bodies have got together to create the Chartered Body Alliance. Um, I rather think my, my that what, anything that I was going to say is, has sort of rather been explained uh, by what we by, by what we were just hearing. Um, I mean, there's the very obvious fact that uh, all three of us uh, are separate as are separate bodies, but we we face into the same regulators and the same government departments. Um, and frankly, we face into the same consumer market. Um, and I think we're all realistic enough to know that as far as consumers are concerned, you know, financial services really is an umbrella sector and they've actually got very little you know, interest in, in our community distinctions. Um, but perhaps most importantly, you know, we do all share a, a sort of passionate and entirely compatible commitment uh, to professionalism. Uh, at the CII, we call it the chartered ethos. Uh, you can use different words for these things, but but we're we're all at one on you know nurturing knowledge, you know the the commitment, the fiduciary duty towards customers, um, and the and the concept of of giving back to society. So those you know at a at a sort of moral heartland uh, level, we absolutely share the same values and purpose. Um, but I think what today is demonstrated is that in a real practical sense, you know, when, the, where, when there are um, uh, sort of systemic things that affect the whole of society, like climate change, um, it, it really demonstrates how we need to join our technical know-how um, across all, all our three worlds, because, you know, it might look like we're polars apart at the front end, but around the back, we actually connect you know, incredibly seamlessly. Um, and the only way to, uh, and, and it's only by collaborating that we can produce the best learning content for our students and also the best knowledge uh, for the public. So that links me nicely into handing back, back to, well, handing over to Simon Colhane, uh, the other Simon, who is now going to have a little fireside chat with Simon Thompson about the new qualification. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. We're using electric fire, I'm sure. But it's a really illuminating discussion, I think, which for me shone some, some sunlight onto the scale of the challenges around the whole subject and that perhaps has illuminated the importance of both data, taxonomy and knowledge. And of course, knowledge is the business that the professional bodies are in. So, Simon, tell us a little bit about really the development. What led to the development of this new certificate? It's not something that bankers have done in the past. No, it's not. But we we heard from Sean in her introduction and from the panelists about you know, why addressing climate risk is a is a priority for central banks, regulators, financial institutions, the finance sector as a whole, and a little bit about why some ambitious collective action is needed to align our sector with with net zero and achieve the challenging sort of interim targets for twenty thirty and so on, and to ensure that the, the finance sector has the capacity and capabilities required for that. I think it means we need equally ambitious collective action to upskill and, and reskill finance professionals, which is, of course, where the Chartered Body Alliance comes in, kind of building on, on Sean's comments and, and bringing us together. You know, we're uniquely placed to lead the upskilling and reskilling of professionals right across the financial services sector, right across the world. Um, and so it's been wonderful to be able to bring together not just the three chartered bodies, but our cross-sector syllabus panel. You know, we, we, you met um, four of our, our experts earlier and, and between us, I believe we've developed a, a robust, uh, rigorous, but above all practical and practitioner focused qualification that covers the areas we'd expect all finance and risk professionals to be aware of. And, and in that vein then, so did you get panelists who represented all different sectors because you're covering a real wide finance waterfront here. Yep, we, we we did. I mean, we we drew panelists from uh, panel members from all three professional professional bodies. So banking, insurance, investment. We were also uh, uh, delighted to be joined by academics uh, from the University of, of Edinburgh, 
um, and that's particularly helpful on some of the the climate science content that sort of underpins uh, underpins the whole area. Um, I think that we had sort of twelve panel members in all, so. Um, whether we covered absolutely every aspect of financial service, I'm not sure, but it's been really interesting, exciting for us as a banking institute to have that uh, that different perspective that comes in from investment and insurance and so on. And uh, you know, as I as I said in the, in the panel earlier, I, I learned a huge amount through the process myself. So, in essence, then this qualification is really not just for bankers; it's for insurers, it's for wealth managers, it's in fact for the whole finance profession. Yeah, ab absolutely, and and we we are quite specifically aiming this at all finance and risk professionals. You know, we, we talked about why this is important to everybody um, in terms of climate risk being a cross-cutting risk and being a priority for, for regulators and so on. Um, but, you know, as, as you know, Mark Carney has set our sector the objective to ensure that every professional financial decision takes climate change into account. And I think to pass the Carney test, then surely that means that every finance professional, asset managers, advisors, bankers, insurers, investors, risk managers, we all need to be able to develop and, and be able to apply an appropriate level of, of professional expertise in areas of climate risk and, and climate finance. It's, it's critical if financial institutions and finance overall are going to meet our 2030 interim targets and, and then our mid-century mid net zero commitments. So, Having tantalizingly dangled some knowledge there about well, the contents, tell me some of the main learning objectives that people are going to take away from doing this qualification. Yeah, so we, we, we begin with looking at the basics of, of, of climate science that underpin the whole area and the relationship between climate change, the environment, the economy and financial services. You know, we, we're not expecting uh, uh, bankers and in, in investors and insurance professionals to be climate science experts, but we do need to understand the basics to be able to work with experts, and we need that as a basis for developing our professional judgment uh, in this area. Of course, we look at climate risk itself, we, we look in detail at the physical and transition risks um, that we talked about earlier, plus the, uh, the liability and litigation risks too we mentioned. Uh, we look at some of the, the, the key uh, frameworks out there, the TCFD, um, some of the ways of measuring alignment, PACTA and the science-based targets. We compare and contrast regulatory approaches and responses to climate risk at global, regional and, and national levels, looking at how some of the regulatory approaches are beginning to harmonise thanks to the work of bodies such as the Network for Greening the Financial System um, and the work of the various sustainability standard setting boards, uh, as Leon mentioned uh, in the panel earlier. Um, we then move on uh, uh, to look at the, the final two areas. We look at how we can develop and sustain strong, purposeful, climate-aware cultures, and also look at the opportunities for the financial services sector from the transition to net zero. Not, not just the commercial opportunities as a form of risk mitigation, uh, I, I guess, but the, the opportunity to further rebuild the connection between financial services and society as we tackle the global climate crisis, which you know, is, is hugely important. That sounds like a heck of an agenda. I mean, it is, it how is. long will it take the average student to actually complete that? How many hours is it going to be? It is. Well, we, we, are, we, are, we are trying to, to, to pack in a lot, it's true. But, uh, you know, formally speaking, the certificate in climate risk is a, a 13 credit qualification, which equates to 130 notional learning hours, which is similar to many, many uh, similar professional certificates that our, our three bodies run. Personally, I'd estimate that a kind of a diligent student balancing work and study might on average study for, let's say, five to, to six hours a week to, to, to work through this. It's chunked into nine, nine units. So, you know, um, spending a, an average of a fortnight, two or three weeks on each, I think is perfectly manageable. Although, of course, it does depend on existing subject knowledge and work and family commitments and so on. Well, I was going to ask you about existing subject knowledge. Is there any prerequisite to take the examination? No, no, there isn't. Um, you know, we're, we're, this isn't a qualification for people who are already climate risk experts or specialists. Uh, this is for all finance and risk professionals who want to develop their knowledge and expertise in this area. So what level is this qualification? I know you have, in Scotland, you have a different level. In the UK, we have another different level. Can you yeah, give well, me so the, the numbers? Yeah, so the certificate in climate risk is a is a QCF level four and SCQF level eight qualification, which uh, in plain language means it's similar in level to the first year of a degree programme, which is the same as our current certificate in green and sustainable finance. And of course, many of the other professional certificates that uh, the Chartered Body Alliance bodies offer. Um, but I think it's important to stress that 
this isn't intended to be a rigorous academic treatment of climate risk. You know, there are some wonderful university programs out there that do that. What this is, is a, a practical vocational practitioner focused program, uh, you know, aimed at finance and risk professionals who want to be able to apply the principles and practice of climate risk within their daily activities in their role and their firm. So a level four qualification in, uh, in England is the same level that you have as a benchmark qualification for advisors. Yeah. Puts it into perspective. And so what about the actual uh, test itself, uh, the exam? What format does that take? So the certificate in climate risk is assessed via a 75 question, one and a half hour multiple choice online exam with a pass mark of 60%. Uh, so you receive a, an instant result, hopefully a positive one. Uh, and I'll be expecting you to take it, Simon. Uh, certainly. Uh, you can take your exam in one of more than 5,000 exam centres worldwide, uh, more or less on demand, so there are no fixed exam dates, that's important to understand. But if there's not a centre near you, or you, you can't, or you don't want to travel, you can also take your exam at home or in your office using remote invigilation, which for obvious reasons has been very popular over the last last year or so, but we actually introduced this before, uh, before lockdowns, um, partly to reduce the carbon footprint from our students traveling to exam centers, which is a major source of you know, scope three emissions. We wanted to practice what we, we preached. It doesn't suit everybody, I know, because you have to have a quiet working space and the right equipment and connectivity, but between the 5,000 exam centers and remote invigilation, I, I think we've removed as many barriers as we can to participation. And so the certificate in climate risk is as, is, is as inclusive as possible for the whole global financial services community, which is very much what we, are aiming to achieve. Remote invigilation, certainly, uh, I think we've all, all the bodies have been using that and it is, has been transformational and actually giving greater access. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, the student journey, and I'm conscious we have a couple of minutes left, how is the student looked after? What support does the student get? And how are they going to get the information to learn for the qualification? Yeah, so it's a, it's a fully fully online, online program. Um, and the learning approach, which we pioneered very successfully for the Certificate in Green and Sustainable Finance, includes interactive e-learning modules with audio and video that introduce and support each unit, the self-study using the online study guide, which contains a very wide variety of reflective learning activities and case studies, there are knowledge checks at the end of each unit, and I think absolutely key, there's a lot of personal reflection on an application of what's been what's been learned, which is a core part of our approach to professional learning and, and development. So it's a fully online, fully supported online journey. So at the end of the day, then, do you think people will understand what Mark Carney meant by shades of green and what greenwashing is and isn't? I think absolutely you'll understand that and lots, lots more. Um, so Mark Carney actually talked about 50 shades of green, but uh, as you'll find in the in the book, we're talking about perhaps 500 shades of green. Okay, I'm conscious we've got to go, but last one last question. I'm sold now, let's say. How much is it? How do I register? So the certificate in climate risk costs £565, which includes all the study materials and one exam sitting in an exam centre or via remote invigilation. The only additional cost is a £30 student membership fee. And if you need a resit, there's a £120 resit v uh, available. So to find out more and to, uh, and to register, simply visit the certificate in climate risk pages on the Chartered Banker, the Chartered Insurance or the Chartered Institute for Securities Investment websites. Whichever institute you are a member of or have an affinity to, you can find out more and you can sign up from your own body's pages. Uh, behind the scenes, we at the Chartered Banker Institute will then be sending you the materials. And as of today, you can sign up to register your interest. And in a month's time, on the 28th of June, coinciding with London Climate Action Week, we will enrol our first cohorts and send out the study materials. So, you know, please don't delay and sign up today. <laughs> That's a marvellous line to end. I believe, Sean. So who's going to be number one, Simon? Who's going to be the first student? That will be a, a competition between yourself and, uh, and Simon. And Simon. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. You know, well, get to the website and sign up soon. Yeah. So uh, just to say uh, thank you so much um, to both of you uh, for, for that, that very good uh, rapid fire over, overview of something very uh, comprehensive and, and, uh, and, and quite complicated. And, and I absolutely loved the panel conversation. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously, RMS has been a part of my life for many years as, uh, from the insurance sector and, 
and Ben I've interacted with on a number of occasions, but uh, it was wonderful to hear from other perspectives as well. So uh, just re remains for me to thank uh, the two Simons, um, but particularly to say thank you so much to the Charter Banker Institute team for yes, hosting today, but also the incredible work behind the scenes on pulling all of this climate risk certificate together. Um, and we uh, very much hope that our respective cohorts uh, benefit hugely from, uh, from the work that you've done. So thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, there, there's even a little bit of sunshine outside. So um, uh, have, a, have a good carbon neutral afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.